vida é um desafio diário. E mais uma vez nos despertamos para um novo momento de superação. Uma superação global. Estamos descobrindo juntos como lidar com a imprevisibilidade das coisas. E o distanciamento tem provocado novas maneiras de nos conectar uns com os outros. Essa sempre foi uma preocupação da Dai Chisanky. Cuidar de pessoas e salvar vidas. É por isso que agora não faríamos diferente. Nos reinventamos para zelar pela saúde da nossa população, promovendo em soluções diferentes com a dedicação de sempre. Pois a dedicação de cada um de nós está ajudando a salvar vidas mais do que nunca. A Dai Chisankyo agradece aos nossos colaboradores, aos médicos e a todos que estão fazendo a sua parte. Juntos, estamos garantindo um novo futuro. Mais unidos e ainda mais humanos. Daichi Sankyo. Paixão pela inovação. Compromisso com os pacientes. vida é um desafio diário e mais uma vez nos despertamos para um novo momento de superação, uma superação global. Estamos descobrindo juntos como lidar com a imprevisibilidade das coisas e o distanciamento tem provocado novas maneiras de nos conectar uns com os outros. Essa sempre foi uma preocupação da Dai Chisanky, cuidar de pessoas e salvar vidas. É por isso que agora não faríamos diferente. Nos reinventamos para zelar pela saúde da nossa população, promovendo em soluções diferentes com a dedicação de sempre. Pois a dedicação de cada um de nós está ajudando a salvar vidas mais do que nunca. A Daiti Sankyo agradece aos nossos colaboradores, aos médicos e a todos que estão fazendo a sua parte. Juntos, estamos garantindo um novo futuro, mais unidos e ainda mais humanos.
Dite Thank You. Paixão pela inovação, compromisso com os pacientes. Welcome to more One uh, Global Stroke Alliance. It's a pleasure to have here Gregory Albers to talk about uh, patient selection for hyperfusion with CTP. He has a large experience uh, and he is one of the most important stroke neurologists in, in the world. So it's a, really a, a great pleasure to have you here, Greg, today with us uh, to talk about this very important topic for us. So. You can speak. Thank you so Thank much, you. Sheila. It's a great pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you and, and hope that one of these days I can come visit live and in person. That would be much more yeah. fun than, than these uh, video talks. Um, yeah. I know that there's translation, so I'm going to try to speak more slowly. Uh, I'm very excited about the topic, so it makes it difficult to speak slowly, but I'll give it my best shot here. <laughs> We're going to talk about fusion imaging uh, in 2021. And I'll start off with a, a recent case from Stanford. And you can see these stroke patients come in sometimes at inopportune times. Uh, oftentimes, we're woken up in the middle of the night with phone calls. So this was one at 4.45 in the morning where they call and say we have a 70-year-old female who went to bed around nine o'clock, at least that was the last time her husband saw her well, and wakes up at 4 a.m. with a left hemiplegia. Comes into the emergency room by ambulance. And Recording when, in progress. And when they come through the paramedics at Stanford, we go immediately to the CT scanner and do a stroke protocol, which includes a non-contrast CT, a CT perfusion, and then the third sequence is a CT angiogram. Uh, the reason uh, we do that is because we want to have the CT perfusion processed before the patient is off the scanner, because we feel that that's going to give us the most important information, but that all three of the scans provide valuable information. So our resident is a, at the bedside. I'm still at home at this point, and we can open up either an email or the rapid app to see what the images look like. And the first thing that comes through is a notification uh, that buzzes that an LVO is suspected. So immediately we're uh, interested because this is a patient who may need uh, acute intervention. So we get this notification and then we get pictures, which are uh, very nice MIP images to show us in different planes uh, 
what's going on with the anatomy and a, a red mark to tell us that it's the right MCA where we've got the problem. And you can see clearly there's an occlusion of the proximal right middle cerebral artery. Next thing that comes through is an automated aspect score where we're looking for relatively subtle signs of early ischemia and uh, certainly somebody within the, the six hour window, the current guidelines say the score should be six or above uh, beyond six hours, which this patient is, then the aspect score is a little bit less critical. And what we're typically looking at in more detail for one of these later window patients is what's happening on the CT perfusion. So here's her CT perfusion, and this is an extremely favorable profile in that we see the area that has very low cerebral blood flow is quite small. It's in the deep territory where the collaterals are typically the worst. So this is where we usually see the earliest evidence of uh, irreversible ischemic core, uh, but that the whole cortical region looks great in terms of CBF. There may be some mild reductions we can see by the slight amount of darkness on this grayscale map. Uh, but basically we have a large volume of salvageable tissue because the area of Tmax delay, more than six seconds in arrival time delay is quite large, leaving us with a mismatch volume of 128. So we've got all of this information now about the patient uh, off our mobile phone. And the question is, this is a patient who is now 7.5 hours since she was last known well, what should we do for her? IV TPA, enroll in the timeless trial, endovascular therapy, or no acute intervention. I understand that uh, you have some way to pull the audience. Shall I wait a moment yes. for an audience poll? Yes, please, you can vote about this case. IV TPA, timeless, timeless trial, endovascular therapy, or not a, no acute intervention. Okay, let me see. Well, 20% uh, IVTPA and 80% endovascular therapy. Okay, and uh, certainly there's no reason that you couldn't uh, have both happening. So the IVTPA argument would come primarily from the EXTEND trial and the pooled analysis that was done and published in Lancet, which included the ECAS-3 trial and the EPITHE trial. And what they showed is that patients like this clearly benefit from IVTPA out to nine hours. So it was a four and a half to nine hour window studies showing that if you have this favorable imaging profile that uh, you can benefit from IVTPA. So I think that's a, a, a very reasonable choice. Uh, I don't know how the guidelines in Brazil have handled that. In, in uh, Australia, the guidelines have endorsed it. And in, in Europe, their guidelines are starting to flip towards endorsing it. The US has been slow. The guidelines have not yet adopted IVTPA behind, behind, beyond four and a half hours. So most in the US would not give IVTPA to this patient, although I think it's an extremely reasonable choice. Uh, what the patient did receive was enrollment in the timeless trial. And that's a trial that you may not be as familiar with in Brazil because it's not going on in South America, unfortunately, but this is a trial using TNK, uh, the sister drug to TPA in the uh, four and a half to 24 hour window, uh, TNK versus placebo, in addition to endovascular therapy for patients with eligible uh, M1, M2 or ICA occlusions. So it's really combining what you all voted for, which is the intravenous thrombolysis along with the endovascular therapy. So everybody who's eligible gets the endovascular. The randomization is the TNK versus placebo. And we are more than halfway through the enrollment in this trial. We should be up to about 450 patients, hopefully with luck by the, the end of this year or early next year. Uh, which would be a, a opportunity to expand that IV thrombolysis window all the way out to 24 hours. Uh, I'm glad nobody in, uh, voted for no acute intervention. Uh, that certainly wouldn't be the best choice for this patient. Uh, clearly the IV, uh, pardon me, the endovascular therapy uh, was justified for a patient like this through both the DAWN and the diffuse study, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. So now let's take a, a different uh, patient. This is one 
who presented to one of our community hospitals. This is a small community hospital. They have CT and CTA, but they do not have CT perfusion. Uh, we find it to be incredibly helpful when a community hospital does have CT perfusion because one, it can help them diagnose whether a stroke is occurring or not. Oftentimes it's not so easy in the community hospital to tell who's having a stroke or not. And two, it helps us decide whether the patient can be treated in the community hospital or they need to be transferred to a thrombectomy center. So this is a 69 year old woman. She has uh, coronary artery disease and hypertension. She presents with a left hemiplegia and she came in three hours after symptom onset. She had no contraindications to TPA. So she was treated with intravenous TPA. Her CTA revealed a left MCA proximal M1 occlusion, no major early infarct signs on the non-contrast CT. So she was transferred. This is one of the few sites where we're unable to see the images. So the patient is coming to us and we're relatively blind. We're accepting the read of the radiologist at the outside hospital. And the question is whether this patient should receive imaging on arrival or go directly into uh, the endovascular suite. And maybe this would be a good question to pull the audience. The helicopter is going to arrive about five and a half hours after the patient is last known well. So this is within six hours. We have the information from the outside hospital that there is an M1 occlusion and the patient was treated with TPA. So the, the first question for the audience is do you go immediately into your uh, endovascular suite for a thrombectomy, or is it worthwhile to get additional imaging upon arrival uh, after this uh, you know, two hour plane flight, two and a half hour plane flight to the comprehensive center? So can we ask the audience that question? Yes. Let me see here. So uh, the question is direct to thrombectomy or additional imaging in this case? Exactly. Let us see the question. The, the answers. 76% 70, direct to thrombectomy and 24% additional imaging. Great. Yeah. And I, I expected that numbers would be similar to that. Um, the argument in favor of that is that per the guidelines, the patient is within six hours. They have an MCA occlusion and no major early infarct signs. Uh, the argument against that is that those no major early infarct signs were detected more than two and a half hours ago. Uh, the patient has received a treatment, TPA, which could either lead to recanalization or could conceivably uh, lead to hemorrhage. So it's you know, a little bit complicated because uh, what I haven't told you is did the patient get worse or get better during the transport? But our feeling at Stanford is that when we know the arrival time, this patient was coming in by helicopter, we knew exactly when they were gonna arrive. So we can get them into the MRI scan and we can do a very quick MRI scan, which can give us a lot of information with about six to seven minutes of scanning. So the reason that we're interested in imaging is one, could the patient have reperfused and not need a thrombectomy? Two, could things have, have changed? Uh, and now there's a completed infarct, which would be a situation where we would not uh, go on to thrombectomy if there was no mismatch. So our choice, uh, although it's only supported by about a quarter of your audience, is to get this quick MRI scan. And what we can see from this MRI scan is that things are a bit different than they were at the other hospital. At the other hospital, we had an M1 occlusion which would give you a hypoperfused lesion involving the entire right MCA territory. Uh, 
Uh, right now, what we see is that the hypoperfused area is involving the inferior division. So it's an M2, a large M2 branch. The, uh, 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 the anterior uh, M2 branch has been reperfused. And interestingly, when we look at the territory in the anterior division, we can see there is no diffusion lesion there, which is great news. And then when we look at this posterior uh, territory, we can see that this is all ADC uh, positive. In other words, there's very low ADC, uh, very bright on the B1000. So this is diffusion positive, matching the area that is remaining hypoperfused. And one other thing that we can note uh, if we look carefully at the MRI, are there are some tiny diffusion positive dots in not only the right hemisphere that was involved with the MCA occlusion, but there are some tiny dots also that we can pick up in the left hemisphere. Okay, so now we have this additional information. And now the next question for the audience, and this is our last poll question, is we are now five hours and 45 minutes since onset. So still in the six hour uh, treatment window the NIH scale is uh, 13. And do we go on to endovascular therapy? No acute intervention uh, or monitor for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, what would the audience recommend? Please answer the question. Endovascular therapy, no acute intervention or monitor for paroxysmal AF. Let's vote. And we should have set this up to have more than one possible answer because uh, you could do more than one of these things. Yeah. So the, the big question, of course, is endovascular therapy, yes or no? That's the, the key question at this, at this point. Yes, 58% endovascular therapy, 33% no acute intervention, and 8% monitor for AF. All right, well, we, we do not have a consensus, so this really gets to yeah. the, the crux of the matter mm -hmm. of, of uh, you know, what we've really been very interested in studying now for more than 20 years is the question of what do, what do you do if you have, uh, um, what does a matched profile indicate, right? It's obviously great news that this patient has salvaged the superior division of the MCA. But what we've found in studies that we've done, and now a, a recent study just uh, published um, from France uh, called the FRAME study, is that when you look at patients who come in with a matched deficit, so here's a, a minus 10 ml mismatch, meaning that the perfusion lesion, if anything, is slightly smaller than the diffusion lesion, do these patients respond to reperfusion therapy? And when this has been looked at over the years in, in the uh, diffused two trial in CRISP, now in, in the FRAME trial, as well as an additional trial that's now um, uh, under review by Annals of Neurology, the answer has been no benefit from reperfusing a tissue that has already gone on to have irreversible injury. And what we've seen that is if you get a patient who is out here at uh, you know, several hours after onset and the ADC value is less, less than uh, 620, 99% of these pixels are irreversibly injured. In other words, even if we reperfuse, although there may be a transient reversal of the diffusion lesion, if you come back a few days later, this tissue will still be dead. In other words, there is nothing here to salvage, and that is why we would not do a, a endovascular treatment in somebody who has a matched deficit. In terms of a large core, that would not be the concern. Even if this core was uh, more than 70 ml, uh, we believe that patients who have a mismatch with a large core are very likely to benefit. We're trying to prove that in some ongoing studies, in particular the SELECT-2 trial is taking patients with very large core lesions, and our hypothesis is if there is a mismatch, they, they will benefit. But for patients who have matched lesions, there is a fair amount of data, uh, although some will debate it, uh, to suggest that you're not going to do somebody a favor to return blood flow to an area of brain tissue that's already irreversibly injured. Oftentimes there's breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, you can get increased edema, and certainly we have seen patients have uh, increased risk of brain hemorrhage when you return blood flow to a large area that has already undergone uh, diffusion change with a low ADC. Okay, so let's uh, jump now from these cases into some uh, basics on uh, CT perfusion and just uh, a little bit on MR as well. Uh, so 
what we, uh, we, we like to do with CT perfusion is from the beginning, know is the patient having a stroke or not? And as I'll, I'll show you later, there can be stroke mimics where the CT perfusion can be incredibly helpful. Uh, for, for example, uh, we just saw a patient last weekend when I was on call who had a, a very odd language disorder, uh, but it, it uh, you know, she could basically not talk or make some very odd sounds. And uh, there was no other neurologic finding, but we did the, the perfusion imaging and the perfusion to her left hemisphere and in her entire brain is ex completely normal. And in that situation, uh, you become much more suspicious that you have a non-ischemic cause for the language disorder, whether it's a migraine or a seizure, or in the case of this patient, it was a, a functional illness. In other words, it was a stress-related uh, language dysfunction rather than a stroke. So just making a diagnosis of stroke is really the first step. Is it a stroke or is it not? And then what we want to know is how much tissue is irreversibly injured. So we look to the cerebral blood flow maps and these grayscale maps are going to show us in dark uh, tissue that has very low CBF, such as the ventricles that are black. And here you can see in the left hemisphere, we've got some area that, that is dark, the CBF is low. And the pink area shows that the CBF is very low. It's reduced by more than 70% from the patient's normal CBF values. So this is tissue just like what we showed with the diffusion imaging that is highly likely to be irreversibly injured. And, and we'll talk in a, a few minutes about this question about overcall of core, particularly in the early window. But in general, uh, as you get beyond 90 minutes from symptom onset, if you pick up this very severe reduction in CBF, you can be quite confident that this tissue is uh, irreversibly injured. And then we can look for the mismatch here between the area that has more than six seconds of delay on Tmax, indicating this is likely critically hypoperfused. If you look at PET scan studies, this six second Tmax parameter corresponds very well with the ischemic threshold of 20 ml per 100 gram per minute on PET scan, indicating tissue that is critically hypoperfused and likely to go on to infarct if something doesn't happen, like reperfusion or some increase in the blood pressure to change this volume. So this is a patient who's got a very large mismatch, kind of like the, the patient that I showed you first, um, and is a desirable patient for treatment, regardless of the time window that they get in. Very important to look at technical aspects. You don't want to look only at the mismatch map. You want to see that the AIF curve, which is going to look at how the bolus of contrast pass through the artery of interest uh, is, uh, is, is being recorded here. So one of the things you look at is to make sure that there is a time, uh, a zero baseline before that bolus arrives. If there is no zero baseline, the scans will not be accurate. You also want to make sure there's not a long period of time before that bolus arrives because you don't want to be radiating the patient for a long period of time before you get that bolus. So looking at this maps is going to show you the timing, and then it's going to show you if you have a nice AIF curve. If you don't have a good bolus, you're not going to have a good CT perfusion scan. We'll also show you uh, where this normal vessel is being identified. So in this case, we've got an occlusion in the right uh, middle cerebral artery. So we're going to choose the AIF, and this is done automatically by the program, typically in the contralateral side, in the ICA or the proximal MCA. Uh, so you want to see that that's in a good location. And then you want to see that you scanned long enough. If the scan is too short to see that bolus wash into the brain and then wash out through a venous sinus, then your, your scan uh, may be less accurate. So here you can see we've scanned for about 65 seconds, which is adequate to see the wash in and the wash out of that contrast bolus, even in somebody with poor cardiac output. Some sites will only scan for 44, uh, 40 or 45 seconds. And then if you have poor cardiac output, you will be truncating these curves and then the maps will be less accurate. So these technical aspects are very critical. Now here's a scan where we've got a technical problem. And that is that the patient is uh, not enjoying their CT perfusion experience and they're jumping around in the scanner. They need to be calmed down before they get into the scanner and strapped down tightly to get a good quality scan or else you'll get a non-scan scan like this 
uh, which sometimes we call Martian brain. The whole brain is green. So how do you fix that? Well, one is you, again, calm the patient down, strap them in tightly. But the other thing that you can do is you can move the AIF. If the AIF was chosen from a bad location, you can erase it and then take your cursor and put it on a vessel of your choice. Again, the contralateral MCA, and then you can hit reprocess. And now you can have a scan that looks very readable where we can see, yes, this is a patient who has a desirable CT perfusion profile with a left MCA occlusion. Here's a more moderate movement artifact. Here's somebody who, who didn't have a, a severe movement. The um, AIF was chosen in a good location, but there was movement. And you can tell from this that there's probably a right MCA occlusion. There's probably a mismatch. This thick white line surrounding the brain tells you there's movement. So you're gonna to go to the movement graphs shown here, where you can see movement <clears throat> in the X, Y, and Z axis, as well as rotational movement. And what you can do then is go in and delete the frames that have movement and reprocess the case. The one thing you can't delete is frames along the upslope of the AIF. And in general, you don't wanna delete frames during the AIF, but when the movement happens after the AIF, then you can delete those frames and reprocess and get a better looking scan. So continuing into the maps, it's always important to look deeper. Again, beyond the mismatch map, look for technically adequate uh, a scan, look for the AIF location, look for movement. But then we also wanna look uh, in the four threshold Tmax map, because this is gonna tell us about collaterals. Areas of red, which have very uh, delayed arrival time, more than 10 seconds of delay in the arrival time are areas by definition that have poor collaterals. The larger the red area, the worse the collaterals. So we like to look at the ratio between the green area, which is the Tmax more than six, and the red area to determine what's called the HIR. So here's somebody who comes in who has an aphasia and hemiparesis and a left MCA occlusion, but they have no red on the map. So that's an HIR of zero. There is no red Tmax more than 10 these patients have very slow core growth. It's very optimal situation. These are the patients who are gonna be eligible for late window treatment. Here's a patient who actually looks similar in the ER, but you can see 80% of the Tmax six area has Tmax 10. So that's an HIR of 0.8, and that's gonna predict more rapid core growth. And this can be useful for determining how much core growth is gonna happen during transfer. So when we had that second case and most people voted to go straight into the, the cath lab, I would have been happier with that vote if we had the information from the outside hospital that this patient had a low HIR, so was unlikely to have much core growth. If the HIR was very high, then we would be more concerned that they might complete their infarct during transfer. And here is a study uh, that we did that was published in uh, uh, it was uh, from the Diffuse 3 trial uh, showing that in Diffuse 3, that if you look at growth over the 24 hours uh, since they were enrolled in Diffuse 3, that if they had the favorable HIR, a low HIR, they had very little growth compared to those who had the unfavorable, more red in the perfusion map. And in terms of transfer, this is directly related to that second case. Again, where people were voting, go straight to the cath lab. What we could see is if the HIR was favorable, then they had virtually no core growth, only uh, one milliliter per hour. So over two hours, we would have expected very little core growth, and I wouldn't have argued about going straight to the cath lab. But if the patient had a poor HIR, then we're looking at much higher infarct growth. And these patients with the high HIRs, they had a much higher chance of going on to complete the infarct. And I think you could see in that case, it was a completed infarct in the uh, posterior division of the MCA. So this perfusion imaging at the outside hospital can help make transfer decisions and, and whether you should go straight to the cath lab. The other thing that's very helpful are the image columns where we can look here without any thresholds or volumes, we can just quantitatively look and see how is the cerebral blood volume. Areas of dark blue mean very low blood volume. And if there's a large area that's very dark blue with low blood volume, that's evidence of poor collaterals and it's a bad sign. 
The mean transit time can be very helpful to determine an acute occlusion from a chronic occlusion, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Uh, so looking over all the images can help you uh, make a diagnosis, whether this is a seizure or a stroke, whether it's acute or chronic. So don't forget to look at these maps. They can be extremely helpful. They also co-register the non-contrast CT, which can be quite helpful to look for areas of subacute infarct or hemorrhage. All right, let's talk about what's probably the most controversial area in CT perfusion, and that's the, the uh, concern about uh, core overcall, or what people refer to as ghost core. In other words, you see what looks like a large ischemic core on the CT perfusion, and then it turns out that that wasn't real. That tissue wasn't really irreversibly injured. So this really gets into a lot about what type of software you're using to analyze the data and what thresholds you're looking at on the software. For example, if you have a, a very mild threshold, say call core anything that has a 50% or more reduction in CBF, you will overcall the core. If you used a very strict threshold that you were only looking at CBF less than 10%, in other words, a 90% reduction in CBF, then you would be uh, grossly undercalling the core. So this is something we've been interested in, in uh, for many years. So several years back, we did a study where we took patients immediately from CT perfusion to MRI, and we used the DWI volume as the surrogate for irreversibly injured tissue and tried to say which core threshold would give you the most accurate prediction of the DWI volume. And the answer was 38%. Okay, so that's about a 60% a uh, reduction. Um, in, in uh, CBF. And here's the, the graph that came out of that. This is the core volume, the pink volume on CTP. And here's the DWI lesion volume. And what you want is to have your dots fall into this pink or green region, because that means there's agreement between the CTP and the DWI. And overall, this was a beautiful slope of one with a very high agreement. There was only one problem, and that was this is the quadrant of core overcall. This is what people get concerned about with CT perfusion, where the CTP says there's a large core, more than 50 ml, and the DWI says there's a small core. This could erroneously lead you to not treat a patient who clearly needs to be treated. So when we were developing RAPID, we didn't want there to be core overcall. So the question was, how strict do we have to get with that CBF threshold to make the core overcall go away? And the answer was go down from 38% to 30. In other words, a 70% or a percent or more reduction in CBF. So what we do here is now we're shifting all the dots to the left. We have no dots in this area of core overcall, but we have a number of dots in the quadrant of core undercall. So when we use the 30%, which is the default threshold in the mismatch map, what we're doing is we're saying we are intentionally undercalling the core on average by about 12 ml to avoid that small risk of overcalling the core. So we tested this out prospectively in the SWIFT prime trial and we wanted to see in SWIFT prime among patients who had reperfusion how many people would have a final infarct volume that was uh, smaller than the area that we called core with that 30 percent threshold. And this is a bland altman plot so that anything above zero means core overcall, a below zero means uh, there was growth of the infarct between the core and the 24-hour uh, lesion. So you can see that there was virtually no overprediction of core. There was no ghost core seen. Uh, the, the, if there was any at all, it was a very small volume. The, the median core undercall was 15 ml, which again was uh, predictable based on the fact that we're using this conservative threshold. However, in SWIFT prime, there were virtually no patients imaged within 60 to 90 minutes after symptom onset. And since the time of SWIFT prime, what we found is that if you are imaged in the golden hour, if you are imaged very, very early, you can still have core overcall even with this conservative 30% threshold. And uh, we have a, a big uh, paper about to be submitted from the uh, SELECT trial uh, showing that uh, six of the patients out of the SELECT trial had significant core overcall 
within the golden hour with the 30% threshold, but this can be completely corrected for by using a 20% threshold. And here's a typical example. This is a patient who comes in, scanned 50 minutes after stroke onset, and you can see with our standard 30%, you'd be predicting a core of 57. Patient has rapid and complete reperfusion, and the final infarct volume turns out to be closer to 30. So it fits better with a 20% threshold. The reason for this is that irreversible injury needs low CBF for a long enough duration. So if the duration is short, even very severe reductions may not be enough uh, uh, to kill the brain. So that 70% threshold is not adequate in the early 60 to 90 minute window. So what we've been recommending for the last few years is that if you get scanned at 45 minutes after onset, if you're within the 60 to 90 minute time window, look at the additional map that comes out that gives you multiple CBF thresholds and the threshold that is most likely to represent irreversible injury is going to be the 20% threshold. Here's another example. You can see the follow-up MRI scan after reperfusion. There may be some very subtle damage in the cortex, but the clear infarct in the basal ganglia and the caudate matches in volume much better with the 20% than the 30% threshold. So uh, in, in large data set uh, of select, what we're seeing is that if you use this threshold in the early time window, you can essentially eliminate this issue of core overcall. Okay, a couple more uh, issues about CT perfusion. Uh, one thing is important to remember is that once reperfusion has occurred, then both the green lesion and the pink lesion will disappear. So this pink lesion is estimating irreversible tissue, irreversibly damaged tissue prior to reperfusion. After reperfusion, it will disappear because it is not directly imaging dead brain. Unlike a non-contrast CT or an MRI that's imaging dead brain, it is imaging tissue that has very low CBF. And we know if the CBF is very low for a long period of time, you know, more than uh, two hours, 90 minutes, it will kill the brain. But dead brain can be reperfused. And once the CBF comes back, it can come back in dead brain. So it's a nice example here. Reperfusion four hours after the occlusion, the area that's irreversibly injured, which you can see is hypo uh, intense on the non-contrast CT, now has relatively normal CBF. It also has relatively normal Tmax. In fact, the Tmax area uh, may, may uh, show a rapid arrival of Tmax because of vasodilatation post ischemic vasodilatation. So you can have luxury perfusion. So you can actually have early Tmax arrival. So don't expect to see that core after reperfusion. You're gonna to have to look at a non-contrast CT or MR to see the core. There's another situation where the core can disappear even without reperfusion. And that's shown here. So here's a patient who has a nice mismatch at two hours. At eight hours, you can see they still have an occluded uh, vessel. The Tmax region is growing as the collaterals are failing. The area of CBF reduction, more than 70%, is growing because that uh, collaterals are, are failing. You're getting more irreversibly injured tissue. And you can start to see it on the non-contrast scan. The cortex is still viable. These are the type of patients that got enrolled in the, the late window uh, uh, trials, such as uh, Diffuse 3 and, and Dawn, and did very well. But this patient remained occluded, and at 24 hours, we've developed a very large infarct. The other thing that's happened over 24 hours is there has been uh, some attempt at collateral reperfusion. Leptomeningeal collaterals have gone on to uh, return some blood flow to the cortex. At the time this tissue died, the blood flow would have been very low but the blood flow doesn't necessarily stay low even with a proximal occlusion because the leptomeningeal vessels can bring in blood flow. And once the blood flow comes up above this dotted 70% reduction line, then that pink will disappear. So let me show you a very dramatic example of this. Some people uh, can't understand how in a big infarct, you could have good blood flow and it absolutely can occur. This is a, an extreme example of somebody with a large infarct and very good blood flow. The infarct occurred yesterday, 22 hours ago. And at that time, the CBF was very low in that left hemisphere. 
But then there has been reperfusion of the proximal occlusion. There's still one distal branch that's still occluded. And you can look at the cerebral blood flow on these grayscale maps. And you can see that here is the normal blood flow in the right hemisphere. And compare the grayscale in the left hemisphere. It is brighter. Brighter means higher CBF. This patient has high CBF in the hemisphere, which has a major infarct. Here's the major infarct, clearly hypodense. Here's the blood volume and the blood flow. And you can see that there's vasodilated vessels in this infarct. They're bringing in a lot of blood volume and they're bringing in a lot of blood flow. So the blood flow is slightly higher in the left hemisphere than the right hemisphere. And you're not going to be able to appreciate the core because there has already been uh, a reperfusion of most of this hemisphere. So again, this is why it's critical to look at the non-contrast CT. You don't look, just look at the, the mismatch map, look at the non-contrast CT. And, and, and from the image columns, we can see this is the typical picture of somebody who has a big infarct with a lot of uh, you know, uh, futile reperfusion, vasodilatation and futile reperfusion. Here's another uh, case, not quite so dramatic. Patient comes in again uh, a day after uh, the stroke, unknown stroke onset found today, last known well yesterday morning. And what we see is it looks like there's a mismatch here. But if we look carefully at the non-con, I'm gonna show you that there's hypodensity here and there has been reperfusion of this anterior region. Kind of analogous to that second case where I showed you that part of the MCA territory had reperfused and part had not. So here we have the non-contrast CT. There is a lot of hypodensity here. And when we look at the maps, we can see that there continues to be an occlusion in this more posterior area, very dark blue indicating low CBF, low blood volume, but look at the frontal lobe. There's very good volume and good flow because it was leptomeningeal collaterals from the ACA, which are reperfusing this area. And it probably saved this cortical tissue here but it was too late to save this deeper tissue. So this tissue is dead, but it was not pink on the mismatch map that was done. So not pink on the mismatch map. Whoops, going the wrong way here. Was not pink on this mismatch map because the CBF is no longer low. The CBF was low yesterday. It killed the tissue. The CBF has now had partial reperfusion. And uh, that's why we don't see the pink here. So what we've done on uh, the, the newest version of RAPID is to allow you to see the areas that are hypodense on non-contrast CT on the mismatch map. This was the area where we were getting the most questions. People were saying, why did RAPID miss the core? And they weren't realizing that the core is going to disappear when you reperfuse. So what we are now providing is a blue area where the hypodensity is. So in a case like this, which has had partial reperfusion, a hypodense region of subacute infarct will show up in blue, and the area that continues to have very low CBF will show up in pink. So this will give you an idea that this mismatch of 51 is not a true mismatch. It is really a much smaller mismatch because all the blue area is dead. So it's really the combination of the blue and the pink that are showing you tissue that is very likely to be irreversibly injured. So that should help uh, uh, remove some confusion in these patients who have had a partial uh, reperfusion. Okay, I alluded to the fact that you can tell an acute versus a chronic occlusion from the CTP pattern. And this is a paper that we uh, presented at ISC last year and is currently under review, where we looked at a large number of patients that have chronic ICA occlusions and contrasted them with acute ICA occlusions. Chronic IC occlusions can have Tmax delays. They are typically not as large or severe as acute occlusions, but the big differentiator is the mean transit time. The mean transit time is the time it takes the contrast to move through the capillary bed. And in a chronic occlusion, this will be compensated for. There's still a delay in the arrival, but the hemodynamics improve. You, you compensate for it. So you normally will see a normal mean transit time in somebody with a chronic occlusion and a prolonged mean transit time in acute occlusion. In addition, the CBF and CBV are typically uh, minimally affected in a chronic occlusion. In fact, sometimes they're hyperemic because of vasodilatation, whereas in the acute occlusion, you expect to see reduction of cerebral blood volume, 
and a reduction of cerebral blood flow. So when we looked at the numbers here, we could see that it is uh, quite uh, reliable that in the acute occlusion that you are going to virtually always pick up the uh, prolongation of the mean transit time, where it is in the chronic occlusions, the mean transit times are virtually always symmetric. So this can be quite helpful. All right, let's uh, take a look at this case and see if you can figure out what's going on. This was actually a patient who was enrolled in the timeless study because at the site, they thought this was a patient who had a infarct in the right uh, hemisphere. It was a 73 year old female, comes in with left-sided weakness and confusion in the late time window. Uh, the imaging, if we look at the image columns here, this is supposed to be a right hemispheric infarct and look at the Tmax here. There is no Tmax abnormality in this hemisphere. In fact, there may be early arrival of Tmax compared to the left hemisphere. We don't see any uh, uh, change in mean transit time. If anything, slightly uh, faster transit time in this hemisphere. And look at the cerebral blood volume and the cerebral blood flow in that symptomatic hemisphere. You can see it is increased in that hemisphere uh, compared uh, to the, uh, the left hemisphere, which was considered to be normal. So we won't poll the audience here, but I suspect most of you would be able to pick up that this is the pattern of a seizure. A seizure in the right hemisphere will give you more rapid uh, contrast arrival times, increased CBF and increased CBV. And you can see it's in a cortical distribution rather than a wedge-shaped uh, vascular distribution. You can see it's really hugging the cortex where we're seeing this increase in uh, blood flow. So what it means is that we have one patient enrolled in our timeless study uh, who has a seizure rather than a stroke. And we had to do more education with the sites to say, look, you have to look at these maps carefully to make sure that everything ma matches what you expect. If you think it's a, a right hemisphere stroke, you need to be able to see that you've got the, uh, the, the pattern suggestive of a, of a stroke, uh, not other pathology like a migraine or a seizure. And I'm going to, uh, to, to finish up here with just mentioning that we've been really excited about posterior circulation uh, CT perfusion. Uh, this is a, a study done by a posterior circulation study group putting together uh, people who have rapid in, in uh, multiple sites in the US as well as uh, Europe, where we've looked to see that if you have very uh, severe delays in critical regions, such as the midbrain, thalamus, pons, uh, and bilateral cerebellum, that this is going to predict a very poor response to basilar thrombectomy. Where on the other hand, if you only have limited areas that have this red severe Tmax delay, we see spectacular results to basilar thrombectomy. So this is a paper currently under review from this group. So uh, don't circulate this uh, data yet, it is under review. But what we're seeing here is these are the patients who have a favorable perfusion imaging score these are all basilar occlusions. And if reperfusion was achieved, we are seeing stunningly positive results, spectacular results, 65% or so favorable independent clinical outcomes in these patients. Whereas if they don't reperfuse, these are clearly patients who do poorly, 70% a death rate. But what's really interesting is there's about 15% of the patients who have a very malignant looking uh, profile. These are the patients who have uh, the red in critical areas, midbrain, thalamus, pons, they have a poor CAP score, unfavorable score. And what we can see is that even with reperfusion, nobody had a rank in zero, one, two, or three. We had one patient who had a rank in four, everybody else died. Now these patients do very poorly regardless of reperfusion. So it's a very bad prognostic but, but you can imagine getting even a handful of these patients into your basilar artery occlusion randomized trial could really blunt the results. And obviously people are concerned that best in basics failed to show a significant benefit. So we are starting right now the um, precise trial, which is looking at prospectively enrolling a large number of basilar occlusion patients. We will be treating all of them and we will try to confirm this hypothesis that perfusion imaging may be able to allow you to select the favorable versus unfavorable a candidate for basilar thrombectomy. I'm gonna finish commenting uh, briefly about MR. I was asked to mention MR perfusion. It's very similar to what's going on with CT perfusion. 
It's just you have uh, an ADC threshold rather than a CBF threshold to identify irreversibly injured tissue. Very important to remember that after reperfusion, you can get a transient resolution of this low ADC. So you can reperfuse a patient and this diffusion lesion can disappear. It doesn't mean the stroke has gone away. You have to come back beyond 24 hours and take another picture and then you'll see the, the lesion has returned. So transient reversal of DWI occurs when you get an increase in the ADC because of reperfusion. The image columns on the MRI are just the same as what we talked about. Very helpful to look at the mean transit time can help you determine acute versus chronic. And the CBF and CBV patterns can be helpful, uh, again, for uh, helping to determine is this a seizure or is this a stroke. Uh, in a typical stroke, again, you're gonna get low CBF and low CBV. If you have a huge area with no blood volume or no blood flow, it's a very bad prognosis. Uh, and that's something that we're looking at in these ongoing large core trials. And finally, just what I alluded to earlier, uh, our life on call has been totally transformed by having an app. No matter where I am, I can get all of the key information from all of my outside hospitals. I've got 10 hospitals where I can see this information. If you're running a clinical trial, it's incredibly helpful to help determine is the patient eligible or not uh, for enrollment. Uh, based on the app. And if you're actually at a, a laptop or your desktop computer, you can get all the same information on the desktop, uh, which makes it very easy to see this information from your referring hospitals. So I'm gonna stop at this point and uh, say that uh, we are still big believers in time as brain. The sooner we treat the patients, the better. We still rush around to, to treat patients as soon as possible. But rather than using time as brain as a reason not to treat, we now like to think about timing every brain. We've had patients come in 48 hours after symptom onset with a favorable perfusion imaging profile. We've reperfused these patients and had excellent outcomes. So, you know, we believe that there is no time window that's going to be written in stone, that we should not use arbitrary time windows. We should really look at the physiology, try to figure out what's salvageable when you see the patient, and then make the clinical decisions based on what's best for that individual. So uh, hopefully I didn't go over time too much. It was a, a great opportunity to talk to your group. Looking forward to any questions or comments. Wonderful, Greg. Thank you. Wonderful lecture. It's perfect. Um, Gisele, Otavio, do you have some questions to Greg? We have a comment in the chat from Rodrigo Guerreiro, Greg. Uh, asking about what do you think about uh, Goyal statement about not to use core concept, but uh, severely ischemic tissue, tissue as tissue with uncertain viability at the time of imaging, not to use core concept. Yeah, so there's a paper in Stroke that it's being referred to where yeah. uh, Goyal and Carl's colleagues suggest that we use a term called SIT-UV. SIT dash yes. UV instead of core. Um, so personally, I don't think it's a great term. I think it's a confusing term. It's not the, the nicest sounding term, SIT UV. Uh, it, and the reason that they're proposing the core, that concept is, is trying to make the point that you really don't know what's dead or what's not dead. And uh, as I've tried to argue a little bit today, uh, I, I disagree. Uh, I think that we can get a very good handle on, on what is dead and what's not dead. If you look at MR imaging, uh, even in the early time windows, what we've seen is that if you have a very low ADC, that that tissue, 99% of those pixels will be incorporated into a follow-up flare that you do three to five days later. The reason that there's confusion about the core with MR is what I alluded to earlier about the transient reversal. We have plenty of examples of cases. I have a, a very dramatic one that I like to show where somebody comes in early on, they have a huge diffusion lesion, we reperfuse them, and the diffusion lesion completely disappears. So that's the argument. Look, it doesn't mean anything. It completely disappeared. Two days later, we take another picture. It's all back. So these papers that talk about this dramatic diffusion reversal, uh, you know, they, they often are looking at early uh, uh, imaging where they've caught that transient reversal phase. Then 
uh, I will certainly admit, and we published, that there are rare cases of diffusion reversal, right? We had uh, a couple of them in diffuse mm -hmm. too. We, we've, you know, we, we, you've got the exception to every rule. So there will be the rare case where we can have 20, 25 cc's of permanent diffusion reversal. So just the fact, just because there's one rare uh, uh, exception to the rule, I don't think means that you throw away the core concept. I like to use the term estimated core, giving us the idea that yes, we don't know 100% sure that's dead, but we are estimating that that's tissue that's likely to be irreversibly injured. And if my infarct volume winds up being five milliliters smaller, I'm happy. It doesn't mean the concept is dead. And when we have people who come in with a huge core on MRI, they wind up with a big infarct. They don't wind up with a small infarct. So I think the concept is, is not dead. It's just understanding the nuances. And adding the term sit uv I don't think really helps you understand the nuances. So what about mm -hmm. CT perfusion? We've already addressed this to some extent. One of the problems is that there is very different core uh, calculations coming out of different software. If you look at what happened in the uh, uh, Mr. Clean trial, they used a version of the Philips CTP uh, software that grossly overcalls core. And I showed you, you can get any core you want by using different thresholds. So in the Mr. Clean data, they were getting very large core volumes. And of course you could say, well, look, their final infarcts are gonna be smaller than their core because they have overestimated the core. We have examples with the rapid uh, where we have overestimated the core and we have traced virtually all of these to these ultra early time window. So as I said, you need a different threshold. If you use the 30% threshold and somebody scanned 45 minutes into it, it makes sense you'll overcall the core. You haven't had enough time to have irreversible injury. But when we looked at the diffuse three data, there was one patient who had a final infarct volume that was smaller than the baseline core. So again, I'm not saying 100% of the time, but 99% of the time when you're beyond, uh, you know, a couple hours afterwards, you don't wind up with significant uh, core overcall or, or what, what they, uh, you know, like to call this ghost core concept. So it depends on doing a good quality CTP, uh, knowing your software, knowing the right thresholds, knowing the time between when the patient was last known well and when we were injured. And, and then I, I think we have a, a very viable concept of core, uh, but we just have to understand there's some nuance to it. It's not quite simple, so simple. And, and if you look at poor quality imaging, then clearly you're, you're not gonna be able to make intelligent decisions on what's core and what's not core. Perfect. Brackman. Yeah, may, may I? So, so such an excellent lecture and well, great for everyone who is listening to us. We're going to be able to now have the le the lecture recorded. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you. So, do you think that uh, uh, when you see a core lesion, do you think that they, what we are seeing uh, within the core is completely homogeneous, or can you have like sometimes uh, after? when we do like CT scans uh, to follow up the patients, we do see that that area was infarcted, but there are some viable areas within the, the lesion. So as it was not a complete infarct, an homogeneous infarct. So do you think that within the core, there, that there might be like different areas receiving different amount of blood and will us be able to check for that in the future? And could you think that this might have an influence upon prognosis? Every one of us have seen like areas, patients who have like MCA infarcts, and then at, after one month, we we check for the imaging and there is not malacia of the whole MCA. We, we have some areas that are still viable. We see some uh, uh, gyro, gyri that are, seems to be normal. We don't know. Well, how do you think we can better imaging this, this and, and how to account for this if, if it is not an homogeneous area of, uh, of you know, low, low blood flow? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Uh, it's something that we've been interested in in a very long time. Uh, we, we were quite lucky that uh, Mike Mosley, who's the MR physicist who first showed that diffusion imaging could identify ischemia in real time, was with us at Stanford. And, and one of the things that we did when we started doing diffusion imaging in uh, human patients was also do a lot of work in the animal models to try to look at exactly what you're talking about. 
So one of the things you could do is you could put a filament into the MCA of, of a mouse or a rat for a very short period of time, enough time to cause a diffusion lesion in that animal, and then you quickly pull it out and reperfuse. And you can have a completely reversible diffusion lesion, right? We talked about that diffusion reversal, how rare it is. But if you put it in for just enough time to cause the diffusion lesion, and then you pull it out, you get completely reversible diffusion lesions. So the question was, is that complete salvage of that brain? And then what we would do is slice up the, the brain and take a look under the microscope. And what you see is there's no infarction, but there are scattered dead neurons. Okay, so that this, this gives you the, the extreme example of what you're talking about, where you can have the tissue that looks completely normal, you know, on your imaging, but there's dead neurons, pycnotic neurons scattered through there. And then the next step is, is what you've talked about. And we see this all the time that uh, you have somebody who may have a, a milder uh, diffusion lesion and, and milder ischemia, you reperfuse them. And on the flare image, what you can see is some areas that are very bright and very easy to pick up. And then you can see some areas that are very subtle and typically they're ignored. And this is one of the issues when you're looking at studies and you see somebody's drawing an infarct volume, that if you don't window up the flare, you may miss the fact that there's actually a large area that has some mild hyperintensity, but it's not nearly as bright as the obvious areas that you easily circle and say, okay, here's my infarct volume. And, and these patients generally do very well, right? So they may have a, a fairly large area that you can see some flare hyperintensity, but they have a very good outcome. And I think it's exactly what you're talking about, that you're getting a partial uh, areas uh, uh, infarction. Infarction is clearly not all or none, you know, it's the spectrum from what I said, just a few pycnotic neurons, you know, all the way to cavitation and, and infarction, where you can have some uh, white matter that's doing just fine and, and, and some cell dropout and partial function in that area. And then the other thing that is, is such a mystery is the recovery, right? We can see these patients, oftentimes they're young patients who may have a, a gigantic right hemisphere infarct and they've got a rank in one or two. And you look at a PET scan after the fact and you see that not only are some of the surrounding areas in the right hemisphere functional, uh, but it's the opposite hemisphere, right? It's like the kids, right, who, who lose a hem hemisphere. You can get so much function out of the contralateral hemisphere and, and explain why some of these patients with a large infarct are doing well. So I don't know that I have a great answer to your question, which is how can we, we image this better? Uh, but certainly what we, we can see is the areas that have the deeper dive of the ADC, the very low ADC versus the more modest reductions are probably giving you some hint. And then the white matter can be a bit more refractory to the ischemia than the gray matter. So it may be that you can get some more of this uh, preservation within in white matter regions, but I think it's a really important topic, you know, for future research so that we can get a, a better handle on that. So great question. Thank yeah, you. let let me uh, show a case. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, Otavio. No, I, I don't know. I don't know if you can hear me. We are out, out yes. of uh, yes. uh, power. Uh, out uh, without power here. Uh, oh, energy I'm is sorry. off. <laughs> but uh, great talk. Gr uh, great talk. Wonderful. Uh, you know, review of the of the topic. And thank you so much for. Uh, that's going to be very helpful for uh, all of us. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, in line with what Gisele just asked, uh, have you looked into different thresholds in terms of safety on on the risk of hemorrhagic transformation? I mean, uh, is there any is there any possible threshold that we should look into uh, to see in terms of uh, you know physiological variables that could predict an increased risk of uh, hemorrhagic transformations in patients with uh, proximal occlusion? What do you feel about this? Yeah, I mean, certainly there, there are patient papers in the literature that, that clearly indicate that the size of the ischemic core is, is very important in predicting the risk of hemorrhagic transformation. You know, very big cores are going to have higher risks. And what we were really interested in um, is, you know, why does somebody do poorly despite a successful thrombectomy? You've got a, a TICI 2C or 3. Uh, uh, win in the cath lab and yet only you know 50 to 60 percent of those patients do well despite a, a ticky 2c or three 
So we, we've looked at this in, in Diffuse 3, and we just finished looking at it in the FRAME trial, and we found the same thing in both studies, that if you've had successful reperfusion, the more hemorrhage that we pick up within the lesion, the worse you do. And that's not just pH2 and pH1, it extends to HI2 and even HI1. And you know what we've typically been saying over the years is that HI1 doesn't matter, right? A little bleeding into dead tissue, it doesn't you know, do any harm. But in multivariate analyses, what we've seen in both of these studies is that the more hemorrhage you pick up, uh, the, the worse the prognosis in somebody who did beautifully in the cath lab. So I think strategies to prevent hemorrhagic transformation, even the non-hematomal form of hemorrhagic transformation may improve outcomes. So things that are protecting the blood-brain barrier, like the MMPs that we've talked about for years, may, may be treatments that, that could help the patient. Um, so the other thing that, that came out of this analysis from FRAME is what I alluded to before, the big predictor of who did poorly despite reperfusion and frame, and, and remember that's a six hour trial, it's an early window trial, MRA, MR based, is if they had a match lesion. So like that patient number two that I showed you with the match lesion, that was the other big predictor, right? It's the volume of the, the core, it's the age of the patient, was there a match lesion, and was there hemorrhagic transformation, even relatively mild hemorrhagic transformation? So I think here it gives us two treatable things to, uh, to think about. One is that we don't want to reperfuse patients who have matched lesions. And two is that we want to do things to limit hemorrhagic transformation. Okay, Sheila, I think you were uh, about to... Ask yeah, 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 I would like to show a case that was today just to to see what do you think about sure. it. Yeah, it was a case in our hospital today. Yeah, just to see, um, 80 years old woman, last time seen well, 9 a.m., uh, NIH stroke scale 19, left hemiparesis and gaze deviation. Arrives uh, at the hospital today. Here is the, the CT, non-contrast CT scan. This is with the, the we, I changed the the window to see better the lesion here yep. and here. And see some hypo. Well, the, yeah, the, that's the, here we have doubt about the the area if you you have more com com commitment here or not. So, this is the CT three hours from symptom onset. Yeah, the and lower here, sides particularly looked a little bit uh, hypodense. The first uh, images you showed, uh, yes, that temporal lobe. Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks a, a little bit hypodense there, and I'm not seeing the sulci quite as well. Yeah, here, here I, I changed the the window to see better. The, yeah. That is not so. Here we can see better than here, but yeah. we have doubt about this area. Um, and here, sorry, <laughs> I put here, you have a MCA yep. occlusion. And here the map, so it was a little bit before uh, the discussion. And here the, the CTP. Yeah, um, so just as we suspected that that area, the lower slices of the temporal lobe look like they've yeah. uh, got a pretty severe reduction in, in CBF, but there's still looks like a substantial mismatch in this patient. So we'd be hopeful that we've got some salvageable tissue here. Yeah, so the question is first for the audience. Um, do you think this patient should be treated with mechanical thrombectomy, IVTPA, IVTPA plus mechanical thrombectomy or no hyperfusion treatment? Sometimes uh, some, some people ask me about to include in SHARM trial. So what do you think about uh, this case? Let me see. Well, 40% mechanical thrombectomy, 7% IVTPA, 30%, 27% uh, IVTPA plus mechanical thrombectomy, 
and 27% no, no reperfusion treatment. And the following question before I ask to Greg uh, about the opinion, um, is that in the center, we don't have device for thrombectomy. So the only treatment is or IVTPA or no reperfusion treatment in this patient three hours from symptom onset in age stroke scale 19. So IVTPA or no reperfusion therapy because without device for mechanical thrombectomy. May I ask you something, Shalinha? Yes. Do you have the neck place? Do you have TNK? No, not, no. Could we, could we borrow it? Would be a good, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, we have to make the place for tempo two trial, so I cannot use for uh, for this patient, but not to treat uh, regular patients. So, um, sixty four percent IVTPA and thirty six percent no reperfusion therapy. So, what do you think, Gisele? You have and Greg, Greg, what do you think about this case? Yeah, so this patient had a mismatch. Uh, so certainly we were very comfortable treating mismatch patients with reperfusion therapy, whether it's an early or late window. This happens to be an early window patient. If the patient had a, a, a huge core lesion and it was a match deficit, uh, then we would not be as enthusiastic about the TPA or the thrombectomy. We published a paper several years back in, in stroke where we looked at patients who came in in the three hour window, we always gave TPA if they fit, met the criteria. And then we looked at those who had this very malignant profile, very large core matched lesions. And we found that every single one of those patients had a rank in five or six outcome. So we concluded that we probably didn't do them a lot of good with our, our TPA. And uh, <laughs> our colleagues at UCSF, uh, Wade Smith said, well, you know, I can't believe this could be true. Uh, and mm -hmm. he did an analysis of, of his, uh, cohort and, and basically showed the same thing and published it in International Journal of Stroke. So, you know, for the, the question, if I don't have the thrombectomy, uh, you know, am I going to consider IVTPA? Well, for that patient, yes, they've got a mismatch, but if it's a very malignant looking profile, again, these patients who have no blood flow and no blood volume, dark, dark blue on the blood flow and blood volume map in a large region of the brain, to me, that's like a cardiac arrest of that area of the brain. It was severe injury and reperfusing a air, large area of very severe injury that has no blood volume. I, I've seen a number of hemorrhages over the years in those patients. So my answer would be no under those circumstances, but uh, what I see is a, a patient who has an area that I'm concerned about, clearly hypodense, but a lot of tissue that has important uh, clinical uh, value, like the motor strip uh, uh, up, up there that may be salvageable. So in a patient, when I'm concerned that there's a lot of early infarct signs, I'm trying to look at where is the salvageable tissue? Is there language tissue? Is there motor tissue that's salvageable? Uh, and then of course, what's the age and the status of the patient? This is a very elderly patient coming in from a nursing home. Uh, they don't tol tolerate a large core well. This is a, a young person. Uh, I'm gonna be much more aggressive, particularly in that early window, despite a fairly large core. That's great. And for this patient, should, would you treat or not this patient that I show you? This this patient, we would give the, they're within the three hour window, we would start the TPA, but we would get them to the, the cath lab as quickly as possible. Obviously there's some controversy with, uh, you, you know, the, these trials that have now, multiple trials coming out suggesting that there's not a big benefit to the IV TPA, but the IV TPA should not be delaying your thrombectomy. Right, if the IVTPA is delaying your thrombectomy, that, that's a problem. We know for an M1 occlusion, it's unlikely, you know, more likely than not, the TPA will not dissolve the clot. So the real goal is I want to get that patient to thrombectomy as quickly as possible, but sometimes they're not able to get the clot out with the thrombectomy. So having that TPA on board, uh, I, I think is going to be an advantage. And, uh, you know, we're obviously very interested in that hypothesis through the timeless trial, because we're looking at the TNK plus the thrombectomy together, rather than just one or the other. Perfect. We have a, a question here. How long after the, you didn't the tell us first- tell how the patient did. So what happened? Oh, I don't know yet. We treat, <laughs> we treat her, Let, I will tell you tomorrow, but <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we use TPA. Yeah. 
Well, uh, how long after the, the, the CTP uh, can I repeat uh, without being compromised by the contrast uh, for the, uh, for, uh, of the first ISM examination? So how long you can repeat the, the, the second CTP yeah, in a patient? Just, a couple of minutes is, is plenty. And in and, and our clinical trials, particularly in Swift Prime, which was done many years ago, most of the scanners had limited coverage. And we wanted eight centimeters of coverage, so we didn't underestimate a big core. So they would just wait a couple minutes between the first slab and then the second slab. So they'd get four centimeters of each slab. We don't have any problem with doing, uh, you know, two CTPs right at the same time. And we've looked, um, you know, in in several databases. Most recently, we published from Diffuse Three that the patients who got the CTP and the CTA and the contrast in the cath lab had absolutely no hint of a, a creatinine bump or increase in renal failure. There, there was, we weren't you know, compromising the kidneys by going ahead and doing you know, the two slabs of CTP plus the CTA plus whatever was needed to get the clot out. So the brain is much more important. Uh, go ahead, you, can, you don't have to wait. It is not a problem with the second slab to have a little bit of the contrast on, on board. And, uh, uh, we, we, as I say, we like to do the, the CTP before the CTA just because you get so much more information out of a CTP. If I could only see one, I would want to see the CTP because I can almost always tell you where the occlusion is by looking at the pattern, right? You could see an M2 occlusion versus an M3 pattern, an ICA pattern. So obviously we still want the CTA that's going to really give us more uh, anatomic detail about the vessel, but the one that I want to see first is the CT perfusion because it's it's telling me so much more than just the CTA. So that is very interesting because for today it was very important for us to see the CTP in this case. So that is a is a great idea to have before the the CTP. That's and great. I guess that the the question was more technically than for safety, Greg. I think uh, it's okay. Yes. It's, yeah. The the the, the question was. Uh, Technically, for how long can I do a CTP and not get an influence from the contrast that the patient has received some hours ago? Two, two minutes. Yeah. It's yeah, not yeah, a yeah. It's, yeah. It's not a that's... problem. Yeah. There's one paper in the literature that came out. Of Greg, Greg. Greg. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say there is one paper no, no, in the literature. No, no. Please that, go. That. Uh, that, that made the suggestion that uh, the core estimation is not as accurate after you've given contrast uh, and done a CTP at an outside place and then repeated it at your institution. We have not found that to be the case. And I think there's some methodologic issues with that paper, but uh, you know, again, we, we feel that there's a lot of data showing that you know, doing two CTPs, even uh, if we have one that's technically inadequate, that, we're okay at Stanford about just repeating it. Some people are very nervous about the radiation or the contrast. If they are, then you know, hopefully you have an MR. But there is not a technical problem doing a second CTP, and we've seen it over and over and over again. Because again, many of our sites in in Swift Prime, in Diffuse Three, in Dawn, they did the two slab protocol. So it was immediately slab one versus slab two. And when you look at those two slabs. They, they're both fine. It's not like the second slab is corrupted with contrast. It's not a problem. Oh, that's great. Perfect. Otavio? Okay, great. Yes, uh, just wondering, Greg, could you comment on the difference? There's some difference between the thresholds for the ratio between the extent trial and, and you know, Swift Prime. Should we, uh, should we um, look for, diff maybe uh, in the future we have going to have different thresholds uh, in the CTP for IV TPA and, and thrombectomy, do you feel like this is the case? Or should we, uh, we're probably going to have the same thresholds, like 1.8 uh, for everybody? Yeah. You know, I think the threshold you should have for everybody is 1.2, actually. Uh, it's a great question. And uh, if you have to look at the, the history of, of where these thresholds came from, um, 1.2 says that you've got a, a 20% area that it could be salvageable. So that's going to be smaller than a 1.8 threshold. 20% uh, can be very clinically significant. And why did we go with, with 1.8 in, in Swift Prime and Diffuse 3? 
Well, what, if you remember back uh, to before the, the five New England Journal trials, we had three very depressing trials that were presented in Honolulu a couple of years before that, which said that thrombectomy does not work. So in fact, in the United States, uh, we had insurance companies uh, denying payment for thrombectomy because we had three New England Journal trials saying that it does, doesn't work. So when we were asked to get involved with the design of uh, Swift Prime, we wanted really good patients. We were not trying to say, I wanna show you every patient who can benefit. We wanted to show patients who were gonna have a really good benefit, a substantial amount of salvageable tissue, because if it doesn't work for them, it's probably not gonna work. And uh, somehow that's been misinterpreted over the years in, in the idea that people thought, we didn't think anybody benefits less than 1.8, which was never the case. The goal was to find really good patients because this was a treatment that as we say for boxing was against the ropes, you know, was ready to die. A couple more negative trials yes. and this could die. So th this was not to show, you know, that, that you know, a, a core, uh, you know, more than 50 couldn't benefit or a mismatch ratio of 1.3 couldn't benefit. It was to find great cases. And when we went to diffuse three, again, people thought we were crazy to go out to 16 hours. So we wanted to show, we wanted to give us our, the best chance of success. And then once you've proven it, now it's our job to expand the indications and show uh, you know, what, what works and what doesn't work. So one of the, the trials I really like is this frame trial. If you haven't read it, I think it's, it's a, a very good article to read. It's all MRI. People feel more comfortable with MRI than CTP. There's still this concern that CTP may not be as accurate. And, and what they showed in, in frame is that patients with a ratio greater than 1.2 they, they appear to have a nice benefit from reperfusion, but when the ratio is less than 1.2, there's no benefit and a trend toward harm. So what I think is you get less than 1.2, what it's telling you is you have a completed infarct. Between 1.2 and 1.8, you've got somebody who's got penumbra. It's not a huge enough, but it's enough that it can make a clinical difference. As you get beyond 1.8, you've got a big penumbra. And that's gonna make it easy for your study to be possible, positive with a sample size like Diffuse 3, where we got stopped with 90 some patients in a group, right? So if you're trying to show a huge benefit from your treatment, you want the best possible patients. If you're practicing medicine and you wanna have, have benefit for anyone who can benefit, then I'm very happy to treat somebody with a ratio greater than 1.2. Perfect. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Um, Giselle? Greg, I think I asked you the exact same question the last uh, webinar, but I'm going to ask it again. <laughs> it wasn't recorded. You can't hold it against me. Right now. Now yes, it's another. Yeah, another audience, no problem, Giselle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now we're recording, right? Yes. Yeah. Now yeah. Recording, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's outside the ischemic stroke world, coming to uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages. And uh, when we are using RAPID for patients with subarachnoid hemorrhages to try to predict um, ischemic lesions, so patients with delayed ischemic lesions, uh, we don't have the same success that, as we have for um, ischemic stroke. Uh, and I wanted you to, to comment on that. Do you think that it's because the vessel is actually not closed? There is not a, it's not occluded, it's partially occluded and, uh, we've been having some uh, problems in, in, in trying to predict uh, which air is going to infarct using CTPs in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a great area. We need more research. Two of our fellows have done projects. One of our graduating fellows went to UCLA and did a project with this, and, and one of our, our own fellows did a, a project. And what we've seen is that you have to use different thresholds. I don't know what, what you're using. The Tmax threshold of six is, is really not good for subarachnoid hemorrhage. We need to go down to a Tmax threshold of two to start picking up the differences on Tmax. And then for the, the CBF, uh, going to a threshold of about 50 rather than our typical 30, that gave us a much better result. So we're looking for subtle reductions in CBF uh, and subtle delays in Tmax. And I think it will work um, 
but you, you can use the web browser off of the uh, rapid software to adjust your thresholds. So uh, what, what thresholds have you been looking at in we have been using yeah the same the same ones that we use for for ischemic stroke yeah so know. those were set for picking up a, a stroke it's not set up for picking up vasospasm and in, in a predicting yeah. a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient who's going to go on to to stroke so uh, you know you can reprocess uh, uh those okay. cases with much less strict thresholds and then take another look but this is something that actually um you know, Carolina uh, uh, has been talking about getting a group together uh, to, to do a study. And, and this is exactly how we got to this precise grant through the NIH, where we now have a, a very large NIH grant to look at posterior <coughs> circulation. We started to get a bunch of questions. People would say, hey, all your data is in anterior circulation. How do we know rapids any good in the posterior circulation? So we just said to a bunch of sites, do you want to send in your Basler and posterior circulation cases? And then we'll just have a cohort study and see, does this look like it's it's predicting? And one of the sub studies that we've done is saying, you know, if you look at the perfusion lesion in the in the posterior circulation, can you predict the vessel that's occluded? The answer is clearly yes. And then the important one is what I just showed you, that you don't want to use the standard anterior circulation mismatch patterns in the posterior circulation, they don't work, right? And it's the same thing for subarachnoid hemorrhage. You're not gonna be able to use your stroke settings for subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we're looking to gather another group of centers who wants to pool, because we need a lot of cases to sort this out, pool the cases together, send in the DICOM images, we'll reprocess the cases and try to figure out what are the best thresholds to look at uh, for subarachnoid hemorrhage. We're trying to do the same thing in pediatrics as well. We think that a Tmax threshold of four is probably a much better threshold than six for predicting critically ischemic tissue uh, in kids, but we need more data. So getting these projects where we get multiple sites together that use CTP, pooling the data, and then we can use that to get a grant to do a more definitive study. Perfect. Um, well, uh, Maramelia is asking about if it's possible to customize the thresholds in some version of the rapid to use in, in from different pathologies or. Yeah, so the, the most underutilized aspect of the, the rapid software is the web browser. I think 95% of the sites don't realize that it, it exists and yeah. it's a, uh, it's behind the firewall of your hospital. So you have to be within the firewall. Uh, you can't do it from home unless you VPN in, uh, but it's a very simple uh, uh, interface. And what it allows you to do is erase the AIF and with your mouse, you just move it to where you want. You hit reprocess. It allows you to take away the movement frames. So you can take a messy looking CT perfusion and clean it up. It takes two minutes to do this. So once you're familiar, it's really easy and you can set anything you want. This is something the FDA wanted. It, it, they, they insisted upon it. They didn't want th uh, the software to force you to use the 30% threshold or the 6%, the six second T max. You can go in and design a mismatch map that instead of CBF, it uses CBV at any threshold you want. You could even design it with MTT or you can put your T max threshold at any number you want and you can change the color. So you can make very colorful maps. So uh, you, if, if you don't know how to get to that browser, uh, let somebody from Rapid know, they will help you. And it's great for research. Uh, so if you're doing a subarachnoid hemorrhage study, you can, you can create the maps to have multiple thresholds and you can get the volumes from any threshold that you like. That's great, perfect. Okay, Giselle Otavius. Do you have some other questions or? No, Shailen, I think that um, the questions from the audience were all answered. Yes, yeah. yeah well, from Maramela, so I think that we are good. Yeah. Greg, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, we will see much more in our students and other stroke neurologists. We have an audience, uh, wonderful stroke neurologists here learning with you. Thank you so much to be here uh, with, with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, 
hopefully the world improves and we can get together in person. Uh, uh, yes, I hope yeah. very soon. Bye-bye. Right. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye, Greg. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. My pleasure.